All right, I'm going to get started because I think we have a fair amount to cover today with confidence intervals. Okay, hope everyone is having a nice day. It's lovely outside, surprisingly. Um, all right, so this week we're talking about confidence intervals. This week and next week are kind of the end of our base um, review of the heavier concepts. So we covered um, some of this material last week when we talked about sampling and sampling distributions. This week we're going to talk about confidence intervals. It does get a little bit mathy, but I don't want you guys to stress about the, the that part of it. I care more that you understand what the formulas are telling you rather than like how to derive them or how to uh, calculate them because all of our examples use Excel to help us actually calculate the numbers and you're actually given the templates. So the key takeaways are that you understand which calculations you need to perform given a certain type of problem and how to plug things into the templates. So we do have to cover the formulas and what they mean, but focus more on what they mean and how to interpret the results rather than the actual math itself. Um, next week, we cover uh, hypothesis testing, which rounds out the kind of key like core concepts that you need to know to go into analytics and do anything applied. Then we start moving in the second half of the course into actual applied analytics um, methods. So we'll look at linear regression, we'll look at optimization, forecasting and time series data, other tools that we use besides Excel, like Tableau for data, data visualization, which is a fun break, I think, um, from some of the heavier stuff that week. And, um, and then we'll wrap up and do our finals. So we'll talk, our final week, we talk a little bit about A-B testing and clustering, but we're not going to do any technical exercises on them. They're just concepts that I want you guys to be familiar with and they're kind of cool. So, um, so just kind of giving you a look ahead to what's coming up. So let me make sure you're looking at the right screen. Okay, so this week, um, last week, we talked about random sampling. Random sampling is one way that we can infer information about a population. Uh, the other way is to do randomized experiments. So instead of sampling from existing data, we go out, do a randomized experiment, we get the data, and then we have to figure out how confident we are in that, in that data. Um, so when we talk about confidence intervals and estimating confidence intervals, no matter what we do, whether we sample from a larger population or we do a randomized experiment, we're still making an inference about a larger uh, set. So we need to calculate things like the mean and the standard deviation. And those are all point estimates still, uh, either way that you use whatever random mechanism you use, you're still getting a point estimate. So we still have some confidence interval surrounding that point estimate that tells us how certain we are that what we calculated um, falls in between those two points. Next week, when we talk about hypothesis testing, um, that will help us apply what we're learning now and determine whether or not uh, data that we've observed can support a particular hypothesis. So if we think that there's a difference between the two means of a set of data, but maybe between two different types of machines in a workshop, um, we think that one of them produces at a slower rate than the other. That's our hypothesis, but we have to look at the data in a certain way to determine whether or not those the, the means between those two are actually different. So that, that's something to look forward to next week. Our Excel exercises this week are um, pretty straightforward. You're using templates, you're just plugging in numbers. So we're not building anything or doing anything crazy. So hopefully that um, is a nice little bit of break and you can focus a little bit more on the content itself and catch up if you're a little bit behind on 
um, other Excel work from previous weeks. Okay, so confidence intervals are in a standard form. We say the mean is this plus or minus this. So um, the point estimate plus or minus the standard error times some multiple. And in general, if we're making an inference, then um, we're all then we are always going to describe our point estimate in this way. And um, we call the this the sampling distribution. So we talked last week about the central limit theorem. And another way to state that theorem is to say, if we have a standardized quantity Z uh, defined below, and it's normal with the standard normal, that would mean the mean was zero and the standard deviation is one. Um, however, when we don't know the population standard deviation, we have to replace it with the sample estimate. And so that sigma right here uh, gets replaced with S, which means we're looking at the sample, the sample um, estimate instead of the population estimate. And when we do that, we introduce an additional source of variability. And so instead of our sampling distribution being normal, it's now called a T distribution. And um, the key takeaway about the T distribution is that it's the same concept. It's just that that sigma is replaced with S. And we have one new term that we have to introduce. So when we look at the t-distribution, we now have to describe how many degrees of freedom our um, equation has. And the degrees of freedom tells us the precise shape of the t-distribution. So it's based on n, and it's always n minus 1. So when we have a smaller n, um, our normal bell curve is just a little more spread out. So it looks exactly like a normal distribution. It's just a little more spread out. It's still um, centered at zero. Uh, it just is wider. As n gets bigger, the degrees of freedom gets bigger, that distribution tightens, and the t distribution and the normal distribution look pretty much the same. So we use the t-distribution to make inferences about a population mean when we don't know the popula population standard deviation. Um, there are other terms that you'll hear in, in future courses about like um, chi-square and f distributions, and they function in the same con conceptually, they function the same way, but they're re referring to uh, when we're making inferences about variance instead of means. So when we do like regression analysis, you'll see them, uh, you'll see language around the chi-square and the F distributions and they function in the same manner. You, they're tied to the degrees of freedom. So they're tied to the sample size N, but um, they all approach normal as the sample size gets large. So when we want to obtain a confidence interval for a mean, um, the first thing you have to do is specify your confidence level. You cannot do this after the fact. And we'll talk about this more with hypothesis testing, but if I were to run an analysis and then decide on the confidence level after the fact, I'm basically forcing my results to fit um, so that they, they work the way I want to, meaning, um, I, if I set the confidence interval at 95% and then I run my analysis and it comes in and, and um, it's not within the 95% confidence interval, but it's within the 92%, and then I go back and retroactively change my confidence interval um, so that my analysis is okay, that's bad practice. We don't do that. You always set your confidence interval first and then the data falls where it falls. Um, so we use the sampling distribution of the point estimate to determine what that multiple of the standard error is that's gonna go on either side to help you get that confidence level. So if the confidence level is 95%, then 
the multiple is um, approximately two with a large sample size, but we can calculate the precise value with a t value, which comes from the, the t distribution. So the typical confidence interval for a mean is the sample mean plus or minus that t multiple times the standard er uh, standard error of the mean. And that's just the um, standard error divided by the, the um, square root of the sample size. So to find that t multiplier, you we take alpha, which is one minus that confidence level. So generally you see alpha is a 0.05. So usually a, a pretty standard confidence level is 95%. So then one minus 0.95 is 0 0.05. In this case, they give you, if the confidence level is 90%, alpha is 0 0.1, one minus 0 0.9, 0 0.1. Um, if we were to do 99%, then alpha would be 0 0.01. The t multiple that um, that corresponds to that depends on whether or not your distribution is um, one-tailed or two-tailed. But we're going to um, let me draw this out for you. So on each tail is alpha divided by two. So if you remember what our distribution looks like, let me. So our distribution looks like this, and we want 95%. So 95% will be, or we'll do 90%. 90% um, is everything in here. So we're cutting off um, this end, if you can read that, alpha over two, and this end. So um, the, the two portions that we're cutting off on the tails, need to sum up to 90% um, to 0.1. So the 0.1 divided by two is 0.05. So that's how you set this. We want two tailed. If we were only looking at um, a one tailed calculation, then we would just use alpha. But in for, for now, we're looking, we're assuming that we're taking the middle of the distribution and we're cutting off both of the ends of it. All right, so now we have our alpha, we know our, our n, we know our n minus one degrees of freedom. Um, the more that our confidence level increases, the greater the length um, of the confidence interval. So if we want to go up to 99%, we're just including more in here. And as N increases, the standard error decreases. So that tends to shrink the confidence interval. Okay, so let's just look at what these calculations are in Excel. You have a template that you're provided for um, for these. So when you go to do your homework, you'll just be using the template and you'll just be laying in the information. But um, oh, before we move on, there's a there's a spreadsheet that shows you how to um, calculate, like how to do T distribution calculations in Excel. Um, it's there for you. There's a little write up here about the calculating um, for a two tailed distribution. You can see the, the formula, um, but if you wanna review these things on your own, that's fine. I'm not gonna ask you to calculate T um, values in, in Excel. So uh, we're not going to get stressed out over that, but it's there. It's a handy little worksheet. It might come, it might be valuable to you one day. So you might just save it and tuck it away for, for better understanding in the future if you take any um, class that gets into this a little bit more. So the 
the first example is about customers responding to a new sandwich. And we want to find their mean satisfaction rating and then the confidence interval around that. So they randomly uh, sample 40 customers who are ordering a new sandwich and they ask them to rate their sandwich between one and 10. So this is the data. There's 40, they rated their sandwiches. To calculate the confidence interval, this is the template filled in. Um, when you first open the template from your assignments where it's attached, there'll be reference errors because there's no information. So don't panic, just lay in the information and everything will work out just fine. Um, so the confidence level we set first. So the, the example 8.1 is asking us to find the 95% confidence interval. So we're gonna put our confidence level as 95%. And then our sample size, um, we're trying to make this uh, as flexible as possible. So instead of just typing in 40, entering a count is better practice because if you were doing this in real life, it would allow you to add or remove and um, it would include all of your data. And if you want to be able to add um, so that it includes um, additional values, just be aware that this range right now will only count through B41. So if I add something in B42, I have to update this formula to include that value in the range or it won't, um, it won't update. So another way to do this count is to um, like select a larger range and it won't, it won't include the blank cells. So that way it, that afforded me um, the ability to add some extra entries and not have to update that formula because that can get us sometimes. We think everything's kind of automated and then we change the data and we forget that we had really fixed range values. So just keep that in mind. Um, we need to calculate the sample mean because that's what we're trying to find. And then we're trying to find our confidence level around it. So our sample mean is just the average of our data. Again, um, best to use a formula instead of calculating it and then hard coding the numbers. Um, we're very familiar with the standard deviation formula. So we use the sample version of it, not the population version. And then to get the standard error, if you remember um, from last week, the standard error is the, um, the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So that's pretty easy to lay in as a formula. Our degrees of freedom is n minus one. So that's pretty straightforward. We just took our sample size minus one, got our degrees of freedom. Okay, so this is a confidence interval for a we're doing two-tailed, um, our, our sample's not skewed in any way. We want all the people, we assume the mean will be uh, in between our samples. So we're not including like all, um, we're, we don't need to do anything special. We're just gonna keep it at a standard two-tailed test. So the formula for that is, uh, the function for that is right here. And this is in the template already. So what it, the arguments that it needs from you are the probability, which is one minus our confidence level. So this is alpha basically, um, and then the degrees of freedom. Once you do that, you have your, um, your multiple, and then your formula for the lower limit is the standard uh, the sample mean minus the uh, multiple times the standard error. And then the upper limit is the sample mean plus the multiple times the standard error. So in this case, um, we would phrase this as the Sample mean is 6.25 plus or minus 0.51. So this is 6.25 minus the 0.51. This is 6.25 plus the 
Okay, so when you go through this um, and you're laying in your information, just pay attention to what the formulas are doing. They're all there in the template um, for you, but uh, you'll just need to be careful, make sure that you understand what, how you interpret the results. Okay, let me go back to this for a second. So when you, um, I mentioned this before, when you open up the template from your assignment, you see the reference errors and such. Um, so set the confidence interval correctly. And then once you start entering the sample size, the mean and the standard deviation, those um, based on what data you have, everything else will calculate and fall into line. So you won't need to change any of those formulas. They will, stop showing errors once the data is laid in. So don't panic. Okay, so when we looked at this um, example, we're, there's some question about whether or not if you just randomly pulled the for, like 40 people who came in for a sandwich, if that would be really truly random versus like just being a convenient sample. But we don't have any reason not to believe that that sample would be any different than any uh, ra other random sample of customers. So we're going to assume it's safe to treat it as a random sample. But that is something to think about when you're looking at real life data. Um, if you're if you're randomly sampling and like doing a random experiment like that. Um, just thinking about, can I assume that this population is really no different than the, the sample population is really no different than the population as a whole. So we don't have any reason to believe that like that particular day, our customer base was any different than any other day. Um, we also assumed that the population distribution was normal. Um, we have to, or it would be impossible to calculate any of this. So um, yeah. Just, we're kind of relying on that whole central limit theorem to balance out the fact that in real life, nothing is perfectly normal. The text also gives us an, a simulation, which we'll open up here in a second. And um, what it's doing, it has data and um, they're generated from a normal distribution randomly given a mean and a standard deviation. And then the confidence interval procedure is used to calculate a 95% confidence interval for the true value of the mean, just like in the sandwich example we just did. But um, because the true value is known, we can, we can determine whether or not our um, mean was inside the interval or whether it was not. And so we're gonna repeat that simulation a thousand times. And what this demonstrates is that, so here's our population mean and standard deviation. Here's our random sample. And then they run this simulation where they take the, um, the confidence level, the sample size, they go through they find this lower and upper limit, and then they compare the sample mean. Is it um, compared to the actual mean? Was it? Did it actually fall within 88.393 and 107.906? And if it does fall within, it records a one. And if it doesn't, if it falls outside those bounds, it records a zero. And the key thing here is that when they do this a thousand times, um, you can see that 94.8% of the time, the mean is within the lower and upper limit. And that's this is just another way of showing you what that 95% confidence interval means. It means that we, when we run this and we get a sample mean of 98.15, we are um, confident up. So, okay, let me rephrase that. 
Um, every time we run this trial and we get a sample mean, 95% of the time, our sample mean will be within the lower and upper bounds of our confidence interval. 5% of the time, it will our sample mean will be so far off that it won't fall uh, with the actual mean won't fall within the same confidence interval. Um, so if you set the confidence interval to be 99% of your confidence level, then when you run your, uh, your upper and lower limits are gonna change because you, they're, you're gonna capture a larger um, interval because you're trying to be even more certain that um, the actual mean is gonna fall within those bounds. So generally, if the more, um, the higher the confidence level that you want, the more data you're gonna need if you want to um, have reduced the, the, the standard deviation of your sample and keep that confidence interval within like a reasonable level. This is kind of fun. You can play with it um, on your own. It's included in the files for you to look at. Okay, I'm gonna actually um, keep going for a little bit. So now we're gonna talk about confidence intervals for other uh, point estimates, other things that we can calculate. So if we have a population total that we want to estimate, then we can calculate that and we can calculate a confidence interval around that. Um, I'm not going to get too heavy into this in particular in terms of math. Um, we can look at the example, but um, more just understanding how to interpret what this means. So we have a population total. We have a point estimate based on some random sample of size n from size from a larger population. And we need a point estimate for that population total. So it's reasonable to sum all the values in the sample and then project that um, using this equation that they give us here. Don't get too hung up on this equation. Um, the mean and standard deviation are down here, the formulas for it. And because our standard deviation is not known, um, we have to use the sample standard. And um, so we get like a approximate standard error equation. Same, um, the same result overall, the point estimate is gonna be plus or minus some multiple times the standard error. Um, but what that looks like, so we want to find the 95% confidence interval for the total net amount that the IRS is gonna pay out to a million taxpayers. Um, we have data from a random sample of 500 taxpayers. This is the data. Again, um, in the template, we're just laying in what we know. So in this case, we picked a 95% confidence level. Now our population size is a million. Our sample size is 500. We calculate our sample mean and our sample standard deviation. And we get um, our estimate of the total. So our estimate of the total is gonna be the population size times that sample mean. So what we're saying is, we're assuming that the 500 taxpayer uh, refund data that we get, that the average payout to them is that same 
or nearly the same average payout that you would get if you calculated it for all a million people. So we're, does that make sense? We're projecting the average um, of what we paid out to 500 people onto a really large population. And so if we, on average, if the IRS pays out $294 to those 500, we're assuming they pay out 294 to the entire 1 million. Um, so we're just multiplying that payout, that 249, that average payout to the million people. So the, the, that's, we're telling the IRS, okay, if that's true, you can expect to pay out $294 million. Now um, we need to know like plus or minus how, so like what uh, range do we actually expect the, the average uh, payout to, to be? And so to do that, we need our standard error, which we calculate as the population size times the same standard error formula you're used to. So the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So you can see where the same process applies. We just need to apply it to the whole of the population. So that's what's different from this step to the last step because we're trying to get this total. Um, our degrees of freedom is 499 because we had a sample size of 500, 500 minus one. And to get our multiple, this doesn't change. It's one minus 0.95 and our degrees of freedom. So when we go to calculate our lower limit, we take the, our estimate of the total and then we subtract out the standard error times the multiple. And then we add the standard error times the multiple um, to get the upper bound. So we can tell the IRS um, with 95% confidence level that we got a mean of, or a estimate, a estimated total of $294,980 plus or minus um, some amount. So it, we believe it's going to be in between 243,900,000 and 346 million. So they could reasonably expect to pay out somewhere between this limit. So that's how we project uh, or how we would calculate confidence intervals when we're looking at the total um, versus in this case, when we were calculating the confidence interval for the mean itself, okay? Going back to the slides, we can also calculate confidence intervals for proportions. So um, surveys are often used to estimate proportions. So it's, it's important for us to know how to form a confidence interval. So we'll call the population proportion P and the Basic um, procedure is going to look exactly the same, point estimate plus or minus some multiple times the standard error. And um, in this case, with a sufficiently large sample size, the sampling distribution is going to be approximately normal and have um, the mean will be P and the standard error will look like this formula right here. So our standard error and confidence interval are calculated. Um, again, we're gonna not stress out over that formula so much and just focus on what this looks like um, when Excel is doing all of the hard work for us. So if we go back to the sandwich data, um, let's say that we want to find the confidence interval for the proportion of customers who rated that this new sandwich between six and 10, or at least six on a 10 point scale. Um, so we already had the 40 customers who were surveyed and they rated the, the um, sandwich on a scale of one to 10. We wanna know um, what proportion of them rated it at least six and uh, what's that confidence interval around that. 
Okay, so let's just look up. Let's just look at this in here. I think sometimes when they put these this stuff in writing, it's actually worse. Okay, so confidence level is still 95%. Our sample size is the same. We're counting all of the data. Our um, our sample size or the the proportion of customers who rated six or higher, we can use that handy count if function. So we're still looking at this data, but we're now we're just saying only count it if it's greater than or equal to six. So the range of data and the criteria. And when we do that, we get um, 25. So the sample proportion says that 25 out of 40 rate at six or higher, which is the 62 and a half percent. Um, so how confident are we in that proportion? Um, the standard error formula, it's already in the template, but um, it's the square root now of the sample proportion times one minus that divided by the um, sample size. So this formula um, corresponds to that formula in the slide. But like I said, when you get this, it's already in here for you in the template. So it's great if you kind of understand what's going on, but you don't need to recreate it. You just need to know how to interpret the end result from the spreadsheet. So the um, multiple is calculated and then you get your upper and lower limits. So um, in this case, we believe that the true proportion of customers that would, from the whole population that would rate the sandwich six or higher is between 47 and 77%. So that's kind of saying, if we ran this sample over and over and over and over and over again, we'd probably get 95% um, of the time, we'd get somewhere between 47 and 77% as that sample proportion. Okay. So um, one thing to point out about this, um, you'll notice the that's actually kind of a wide range, like, oh, for between 47 and 77%, like you're not even sure if half your customers even like the sandwich at that point. Um, and that this is due to the nature of taking, um, taking your proportion, like how it affects the formulas. So if your sample size is small, you're gonna have a really large confidence interval. It's not, it's not gonna tell you a whole lot about your data. Um, unless you have a large sample size. So if you want to get a 95% confidence interval within three of three percentage points for a proportion, you need about um, a thousand people if the population consists of millions. So when auditors are interested in how large the proportion of errors might be, they then they switch to um, one-sided confidence intervals. So they use the lower limit um, as zero, and then they're determining an upper limit so that the 95% confidence interval is from zero to the upper limit. So if we wanna find just the upper limit of a one-sided 95% confidence interval for a proportion, um, we are gonna look, like, look at a different example where we have auditing uh, data. And an auditor is gonna check 93 randomly sampled invoices and find that two of them include price errors. So 
let's uh, just look at this calculation. Um, there is no nice way, and you're not gonna, this is just so that you know this, there's no um, really great, there's no way to do a one-sided confidence interval in, um, in Excel without using um, stat tools, which we're not gonna go into right now. So they came up with like a workaround for this using goal seek. And all this is, is um, they took the confidence level, the number of errors in the sample size, and they found the sample proportion, which is two out of 93. And um, they just want to know, so they want to know the, um, the upper confidence limit. So they're taking the lower confidence limit as zero. Um, zero to what's the upper limit of errors that I'm going to see. So that's what makes it one-tailed. Um, to do that, they set um, a binomial distribution to the data using the um, n, the, uh, sorry, the um, number of errors, the sample size, the probability, which um, oh, um, it's 0.66 because they made um, an assumption about the or 0 0.066. Sorry, um, let's go back to the slide really quick. Why did they do that? Oh, sorry, that was there. Okay. Um, so they took the, um, they wanted to find the, uh, the, the place, oh, sorry. Okay, so they're setting D10 to 0 0.05 by changing this value. So there, um, we don't know the upper confidence limit, so we're using goal seek to find it. Um, so the 0 0.05 comes from the um, if alpha, and then um, and then they just find that value on the distribution, the binomial, and then they use this 0 0.066 as their upper limit. Then um, when you do that, you have to use the, um, the inverse formula to get the multiple, and then you can find the true upper limit. So there's a lot going on in this example, um, but all you need to know is that um, when you're doing one-sided testing, Excel won't, there's no clean way to do it. So maybe just tuck this away and you'll probably never need to do it this way, but that's their kind of their, their workaround. The point being um, more so the type of situation where you might set the, um, the lower bound to just be zero and you're just only worried about like the upper bound. So they're not really worried about, um, they got two errors in that sample, but they're not really worried. The auditor's not really worried about how many times the, the they know that there's gonna, they're, they're good with the, the samples coming back as zero. They don't really care about that, the confidence interval telling them um, that lower bound, how likely the, um, the actual number of errors is going to be like 0.7 or something. So they just said like, we're good setting the the lower bound to zero. We recognize that there may be times where we have um, audits that don't come up with any errors, and then times that come up with errors. And we're just really concerned with what's the the a total amount of errors that we might get going to come in at. 
Okay, we can also calculate confidence intervals for standard deviation. So um, the standard deviation that we've been using for the sample is S. Um, we've been using that as a point estimate for sigma. Um, we can calculate a confidence interval around that actual S versus sigma itself, um, but then we can't use the T distribution. So instead we have a right skewed distribution, which is the chi squared. And it also has a degree of freedom parameter. And the key takeaway here Uh, so for chi-square distributions, um, there's an Excel spreadsheet that shows you the functions that are related. So for, um, for Excel, there's a chi-squared function that takes in the um, the value and then the degrees of freedom and then whether or not it's a cumulative, which is um, gonna be true for us in case of, um, in the case of one tilde at least. And it has a related inverse function. So just like the normal calculations we did before and the binormal, um, there's a chi-squared and it functions basically the same way. Um, it takes the same types of variables um, or arguments and can also have the inverse implied. So this distribution just looks, it, it, it's the shape of it is just different, the, um, slightly different than the normal distribution because it's skewed. But we can still calculate values for that distribution um, using Excel. So when might we do that? Let's say um, we have a bunch of machine parts and we want to know um, how much variability there is around the diameters of those parts. So um, this machine manufactures these parts. We need them to be pretty much um, the same size for lots of different reasons. Um, but we don't want there to be too much variability in the size of this part because then it might affect how the total, like how when it gets put into a ma machine or goes to market, um, we want it to work, right? So um, in, in the case of like production and machine, we're talking like millimeters. We need to be confident that the variability of the output of that machine with that part is very, very small. So um, imagine like a supervisor just randomly pulling these parts off the line as they're manufactured and checking the diameters to make sure that they're, the tolerance is still good. So the parts are supposed to have a diameter, a diameter of 10 centimeters. Um, we're concerned about the mean and the standard deviation of those diameters. So we want confidence intervals for both. Um, in Excel, This is what that data looks like. So you can see they're supposed to be 10, but they're not perfect, but they should be very close. Um, and they're, you know, they're generally off by some amount of millimeters. And so we're gonna use the same template for the, the population mean. So this looks a lot like the sandwich example. We have our confidence level um, our sample size is the count of all of our data. So there's 50 samples that he pulled off the line. If we calculate the mean for, or the average of all of this data, we get 9.996. And then the standard deviation, we get 0 0.034. Um, we can calculate the standard error with that the same formula that we've been using, the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Degrees of freedom is n minus one. We use that information, the, the confidence level and the degrees of freedom to get our two-tailed multiple. Um, 
And now we have our lower and upper limit, which is going to be 2.01 times 0 0.005 is going to be that plus or minus factor. So um, the mean is between 9.986 and 10.005. So now he has a confidence interval on the mean, but we also need a confidence interval on the standard deviation. And, and th this is where we have to use the, um, the chi-squared distribution. So in this case, I think they actually use some stat tools to generate this spreadsheet and you're not gonna have to generate a spreadsheet like this, but let's just look at um, the output of it. So if we have a 95% confidence level and we pull 50 parts off and we calculate the sample standard deviation, we have our degrees of freedom, we can get the lower chi-squared value by um, taking the probability and the degrees of freedom. Okay, and then um, this is the, uh, there's two, the slightly different formulas here, which you can look at um, if you want, but we're trying to get the lower bound, which comes from the chi squared dot um, INV function. And then the, the additional right is telling it to give us the upper um, value instead of the lower value, if you think about that distribution and the, where the tails are. So the left sided of the tail and the right side of the tail. And then they have a formula here to calculate the lower and upper limit. So don't worry about the actual math itself. Um, in the template, you would it would do all that for you. Um, but what we're saying is we expect that the standard, um, the sample standard deviation is going to be um, between 0 0.029 and 0 0.043. So remember last week we looked at how a how um, a difference in the standard deviation can really affect the um, outcome of our analysis. We were looking at what were we looking at? I think it was like a paper manufacturing example or something in the reams of paper. Um, and if your standard deviation creeps up, more um, more of your parts are going to fail. Um, because it's a bigger spread. So if they were to go on and try to calculate, um, if let's say they decide like um, there's, a, there's a set deviation that's allowed of 0 0.065 millimeters. So if it goes too far above 10 or too far below 10, then they, have, they can't use that. They have, uh, it's unacceptable. Um, so 10 was the mean diameter that we assumed. And um, if we assume that the standard deviation is the higher end of our, uh, is our upper limit, then 13% of, of, of our parts are unusable. And so just to see how, um, since we've calculated both an, a range of means and a range of standard deviations, we can actually make a little two-way data table where we take the upper or the lower, the mean, and the, the lower, the point estimate and the upper bounds for each of them and kind of see what happens to the proportion of our parts that we would have to reject if, um, if any of those, if the true mean were to be all the way down toward the lower limit or all the way toward the upper limit for both the mean and the standard deviation. So when they do that, they get these results. And so if the um, mean is of the, the parts is actually tends to be a little bit low, but the standard deviation is also low, then they're only rejecting like 4% of the parts. But you can see um, if the, as the standard deviation increases, the amount of parts that get rejected also increases. And so anywhere between, looks like four, I mean, all the way up to almost 15% of the parts. So that kind of highlights 
everything we've talked about so far with confidence intervals, um, how much variability you still get and why it's important to provide confidence intervals when you calculate a point estimate based on a sample because the actual population that we're inferring information about could fall um, anywhere within quite a wide range from what we calculated as the point estimate. And if we're trying to figure out um, like acceptable tolerances on our machines or when we should do repairs to bring the, um, the, the standard deviation down, um, reduce the variability in the mean of the parts or whatever, we might be investing money to get better machines. So we need, if we know um, our upper limits, like how many parts we could expect to throw away, it as from a business perspective really enlightens us as to um, whether or not we have a case for changing a business process or spending some capital to buy machines that are more precise because you could imagine even if you could just get the the standard deviation down from from this these are small amounts from 0 0.043 down to 0 0.029 that's 10 percent of your parts that you're hanging on to um, that you were previously having to toss out that's 10 percent more things you can sell um, that's less waste in materials so this is why we do these types of calculations and how they come up in the real world and why they're important. Okay, so we're gonna take a break. Um, it's just about two. We'll come back at 2.10 and we'll walk through um, a couple more things. And then we're gonna talk about um, sample, like selecting a sample size and um, those calculations, and then we'll um, move on and talk about the data analytics life cycle. So I'll see all of you back in about 10 minutes. Okay, let's wrap up this whole confidence interval thing and then um, move on. If you're feeling stressed, remember you're not going to be doing any math. Um, it's all in the Excel spreadsheet. So just knowing um, what to apply, whether you're doing confidence intervals for a mean or um, a proportion or so on and so forth, and then just choosing the right template. So a uh, really common uh, calculation is that we do in industry is calculating the difference between two population means and getting a confidence interval around that. And the, um, the math itself, uh, so the things that change that are relevant are, um, now we have two populations, they might be different sizes, so one might be like 75 and one might be 100. So my degrees of freedom is now 175 minus two because I have two um, variables there. The, that changes the calculations a little bit because we now we have a pooled standard deviation and then a standard error for the difference between those sample means. Again, don't get hung up on the math here because this is built into the, the templates. What really matters is how we actually apply this. So um, let's say that we are going to purchase some motors for our treadmills and we have two potential suppliers. It's in my best interest to purchase the motors from the supplier whose motors are more reliable. So we're gonna help choose the better supplier. Um, so we're gonna buy from supplier A and supplier B, um, 30 motors each, put them in these treadmills and then run the treadmills until the motor fails and then determine what that number of hours is. Then we wanna know if there's a, any significant difference between the mean time between uh, for failure of 
supplier A than supplier B. So in Excel, this looks like a big headache, <laughs> kind of is. Oh, actually. Um, but one thing to note before we um, move on, before you do something like this, if you have two sets of data, so they have the supplier A and supplier B, and the, the hours recorded here um, of the motor, it helps to visualize the difference first so you can kind of see what you're working with. So a box plot is great for that. So you can see it does look like there's a difference between A and B. Um, this kind of indicates to us that a might be better, but we still need to kind of run the numbers because they, they may fall within the same um, confidence interval. Um, so to actually do that, now we have some more stuff going on because we have two samples. So we have um, supplier A and supplier B. We have the sample size for A and sample size for B in this situation happen to be the same. Um, when we initially calculate the averages for supplier A and supplier B, we get uh, a higher number of hours before failure for supplier A. Um, on average, we get 749 or so versus like 656. But we can't really stop there because we know that these are point estimates and there's some variability around the two samples. And it's possible that the variability around one sample is very large and one is very small and they end up not being all that different. So we're gonna continue on and um, look at the standard deviations between the two samples. So you can see the standard deviation for sample uh, for the supplier A is larger. So while they have a higher, um, sample mean, they also have a higher standard deviation than sample B. So then there was that pooled standard deviation that um, is already calculated for us. And, um, and then we have this new standard error, our new degrees of freedom and um, our multiple, which we use the T distribution for two-tailed. So no, uh, our lower limit is now negative and our upper limit is um, positive. So that um, indicates to us that the suppliers are not really all that, all that different. Um, we would have expected to see I'm just trying to figure out if I want to get into Okay. So let's go back to this. The way we're going to interpret this um because zero is included in this interval, we don't really, we can't really say for sure that um, there's a difference between the two uh, population means. So we could probably go with either supplier at this point. Um, we might be more inclined to choose supplier A just based on the data that we're given but there's no like compelling mathematical argument to choose one or over the other. Um, yeah, so at this point, we might look at other things like is, is there a trade-off if we go with supplier B in terms of cost? Maybe supplier B is a lot, lot cheaper since we have no compelling evidence to show that their motors are really all that much worse. Um, maybe we choose them. Maybe supplier A has a better warranty and the prices are comparable. So other things are going to influence the decision of which supplier, but it's not going to be the, um, the failure times. 
Okay, another um, concept to cover. So when you're comparing two populations, um, like in the analysis we just did, um, when you start out, you're assuming that the standard deviations of the larger population as a whole are equal. Um, but if you, how do we tell if they are and, and what do we do if they like definitely clearly are not? Um, there is a test for that with stat tools, um, but we, we don't need to get into that level of detail in this course. So in, in your text, if you're reviewing it, you can gloss over this section. Um, the only point here is that there's other ways to calculate um, population uh, difference, confidence intervals for differences between the means of two populations if you think that the standard errors are wildly off between the two. Um, let's look at a scenario where we have paired samples. So in this case, uh, we're taking a, a sample um, and we're doing a survey before a sales pitch, and then we're doing a survey after a sales pitch. So the pretest and the post test um, for these husband and wife pairs for this survey. If um, we call this a paired procedure because um, it's not really two different samples because it's the same population being surveyed twice. Um, and so we aren't the, the um, pretest and post-test scores, we want to know the difference between those scores, but the, the um, samples are not random, they're paired. So the, we're pairing the husband-wife pretest with the same husband-wife post-test. So like um, sample, like a uh, couple A is the same in each, um, in each sample. So they're not like random different couples for the pretest and random different couples for the post-test. So same sample um, paired with two different tests. So um, in that case, it's the appropriate thing to do is to look at the differences between the two scores for each pair and then do a one sample analysis on the differences. So let's, it might help to just walk through it. Um, so we have these husband and wives ratings of uh, Honda Buick dealership and uh, at two different points in time. And we wanna see if there's a difference before they, I think they're test right. Um, yeah, so before the sales presentation and after the sales presentation. So now um, all we're basically doing is kind of introducing an, a variable that tells us the difference between our, um, our husband and wives. So here's the initial dating data. So pair one, um, the husband rating and the wife rating. So to get the difference, they took, let's see, um, the difference between this, the rating for pair one and the um, rating for the wife. So they want to, they want to compare the mean of their husbands versus the mean of their wives. Um, but they suspect that each pair thinks alike. So they're highly correlated. Um, and um, so we're going to kind of treat the husband wife pair as one variable instead of two. So we're going to consolidate the two variables of the husband wife pair into one variable. We get our difference. And then we use the same process now that we would for doing the confidence interval for a mean, but we use this difference data instead of the um, husband and wife data. Whereas like with the motors, we um, had to do all of this work because we had 
the two separate samples, we're treating these as paired samples. So we're, we're going to simplify it back down to um, confidence intervals for the difference between the husbands and the wives. When we do that, um, it looks like they got a sample mean um, the, of the difference between them was about um, 1.6, um, but the lower bound was 1.0, just about 1 to 2.2. .2. Um, for this example, sorry, one sec, just want to make sure. Okay, so if we had instead treated them as separate, um, we could have run the example as if they were um, motors. And we would have gotten um, much different results. So notice the lower and limit, upper limits now is between like 0.8 and 2.3 versus the 1 to 2.2. So, um, because we treated them as a paired sample, we reduced some of the variability, basically. We could do the same type of um, analysis but um, instead we could look at the difference between proportions. So we could do, um, instead of looking um, like with the motors where we had 30 uh, from supplier A and supplier B, we could look at two different groups and see if the proportion of something within those groups is significantly different than the other. Um, so instead of comparing the means, we could compare their proportions. And the example that the book talks about is finding a confidence interval. Um, so they took 300 customers and they sent them all um, uh, uh, an ad about a, a coming sale, but they split the 300 into two groups. So for 150 of them, they only sent information about the sale. And for um, the other 150, they also sent a 5% coupon and they wanna know if their proportion of customers who make a purchase is different between the group that they sent a coupon to versus the group that they didn't. So they'll track which of these customers purchase appliances after getting the sale notice. And then they wanna see if there's, uh, um, what the difference is between the, the proportions. So they broke their data into, yes, they received a coupon or no, they did not. And then yes or no for purchasing. So for the group that, um, both groups have the same sample size, for the group that purchased um, with the coupon, they just do the count its function they count on uh, the coupon effectiveness data looking for, um, yes, they made a purchase and yes, they got a coupon. And then for this one, they're looking for, yes, they made a, uh, they, they, yes, they made a purchase and no, they did not get a coupon. Then when they um, looked at the proportions, they calculated out and they said, okay, so 37% of the people who received a coupon purchased a product, but 23% of the people who didn't receive a coupon um, purchased a product. So the difference between the proportions is about 13%. However, um, when you calculate the standard error in the multiple and you calculate your confidence interval, you get anywhere from 3% to 
So let's remember with proportions, we get like a lar larger of a spread. So this is kind of telling us like sending out the coupon made anywhere from almost negligible impact to a pretty sizable 23% difference impact. Um, they might try running the same experiment with a 10% coupon and seeing if they get um, a better difference between the proportions. And because um, their goal is to incentivize people to buy. And if it's if the lower limit here is 3%, um, we're not our confidence that we had a um, have an effective sales campaign is not super strong. They could also try it with a larger group and see if they could tighten down with a higher N, if they could get a better, a tighter confidence interval and get a better idea of what the actual difference is between coupon recipient, recipients and non-coupon recipients. So there's a couple of ways to go forward from here, just depending on um, you know, how big their customer base is in general. Maybe they only have 300 customers and they sent something to all of them um, and how much time they want to spend on this type of analysis. But you could see how useful this is, information is and how why, why we don't just take the point estimates for samples, um, no matter how we do it, whether we do sampling, uh, random sampling or we do randomized experiments, we don't just take the mean or the standard deviation at face value. Um, this is why we calculate these confidence intervals because we want to know um, how much stake we can put into our answer. Okay, so the last bit of this stuff is, let's flip this around a little bit and um, talk about how to choose the right sample size. So confidence intervals are affected by three things. Um, they're affected by the, the standard deviation. They're affected by um, the sample size, and they're affected by the confidence level that we choose. So we can't really do much about variance and the confidence levels generally pretty much set um, by, large, like by far and large, 95% is pretty much the gold standard. Rarely do you see less than that. Um, and only in strict cases would you see a higher confidence level. So of all those things, the easiest to tinker with is your sample size. Um, this helps us shrink or increase that confidence interval length. Generally, we, we're trying to increase the confidence intervals because we want we want to be pretty confident that our sample estimate is close to the population estimate. So we're trying to narrow that interval down. Um, We've been talking about our point estimates so far as some value plus or minus um, some other value. So this value right here is the half length of the interval um, and we'll call it B. So the total interval is 2B, but when we say, you know, the mean is 10 plus or minus 2, 2 is the half interval. If we want to change that 2 and make it smaller, we have to increase our sample size. To do that, um, to calculate appropriate sample sizes, we could we could use a formula. However, um, in order to use a formula, <laughs> we generally don't have a sample already observed. So we don't know the, um, the value of S. And 
So um, we can make some assumptions in order to come up with a rough approximation. So we can't use the T distribution. So we got to use, we got to assume normality and we'll pull uh, values from the standard normal distribution instead. So we'll pull a Z value instead of a T valuable or the, the corresponding Z multiple. Um, so we know we're going to be a little bit off there because if you remember, we talked about the difference between the T distribution and the, and the normal. Um, remember the T distribution for smaller ends is a bit wider, but we're going to assume that since our N is going to be sufficiently large that we can use the normal distribution as a good approximation. So we're going to use the Z multiples. And then we're going to have to make some, some guess at the population standard deviation um, somehow. So that information would either be provided to you or um, we'd have some prior calculation that we could use to infer that information from. And then from there, we could just solve for, we're just solving for N. We're just making some substitutions based on these assumptions. Otherwise, um, it's kind of like cart before the horse. There's no way to know the right sample size because we don't have sample to get standard deviation from. Um, so what does this look like? We're gonna look at um, doing this for a couple of different scenarios. Um, and this is all in a template as well. So the first one, we go back to our, um, our sandwich dude that we talked about in um, early on. We talked about, that was our first example we did where he pulled the 40 customers. So based on that random experiment, um, at the 95% confidence interval, we found that um, the mean rating was between 5.7 and 6.7, 6.8, with that uh, B, that half length interval of 0 0.511. So how large do we need to make our sample size to reduce that interval to 0.3? Um, so instead of being, uh, in, so in this formula, we're reducing B down to three. And um, if we go back to that data, what we're saying is we want instead, um, instead of being able to say that the sample mean is 6.25 plus or minus 0.5, and remember that um, that half length is just the multiple times the standard error, so 0.51. So instead of saying that the average rating of the sandwiches is 6.25 plus or minus 0.51, we want to be able to say it's plus or minus 0.3. So we're trying to tighten that interval and be more confident about our sample mean. So in order to do that, we need to calculate the um, how many more people would we have to pull. So to do that, let's look at sample sizes. Here we go. Okay. So 95%, um, our ha new half length is 0.3. The standard deviation was um, in that example, was 1.597. So they just carried that over. Um, we're using that, to, we're, we're gonna say, okay, we're gonna assume that that's the, the population um, standard deviation because we have nothing better to go on. To find the Z multiple, we're gonna use the inverse um, of the normal distribution for a sample, um, just like we did a few weeks ago. Um, where we have our probability and just the note, the um, take a look at this probability formula later. But when you look at your template, they, they calculated the Z multiple, they put the formula in there for you. So to get the sample size, um, we just plug that into that formula, um, which they've just translated into Excel. So it's the Z multiple times the standard deviation divided by B, which is that new half length of 0.3, and then that's squared. And um, 
we get a new sample size of 109. So he, we just were, we're kind of guessing here because we had to make a bunch of assumptions, but we need a sample size of at least 109 in order for us to shrink that um, confidence interval down from 0.5 to 0.3. So that's a, that's a lot more. I mean, if you think about it, you're adding more than double your original um, sample size to get less than half a reduction in the half interval. So that's something to think about. Okay, um, let's see if we can estimate. So if, if we wanna do a sample size estimation, but we wanna do it um, for other things. So instead of mean proportion, the difference between means or the difference between proportions. So thinking back to our examples, um, like the difference between proportions would have been the example with the coupon customers. Um, same concept, but slightly different formulas, all of which are done for you in Excel. Um, so for the proportions, you're plugging in the same information. So let's say um, we want to find the sample size of customers required to achieve a sufficiently narrow confidence interval for the proportion of customers who have tried the new sandwich. So same data set, but now um, we want to estimate the proportion of customers who have tried it and they want a 90, she wants a 90% confidence interval with a half length of 0 0.05. So um, if she's fairly sure that the proportion of customers who have tried it is 30%, she can use that as her estimate. So in this case, um, we're taking the same calculation as before, but then we have to multiply it by this factor using the, the estimate of the proportion. Um, so that's why we need that additional information. It adds an extra calculation. But in our example, we would just plug in the confidence level, the new half length, the estimated proportion, and then, um, we get a sample size of 228 would be needed for that. So when you're thinking about um, how to do these, the Excel template has everything calculated out and it's just a matter of knowing um, based on the objective, which formulas or which um, scenarios to use. So let's say, um, Instead, we want to see how many employees in each experimental group must be sampled to achieve a sufficiently narrow confidence interval for the difference between the mean number of complaints. So a customer service center has two types of employees, those who've had a recent course in dealing with customers and those who have had um, but no experience and those who have a lot of experience but no formal training. Uh, they want to estimate the difference between the two types of employees in terms of average number of complaints. And they want to be sure that their confidence interval half length is about two uh, with a 95% confidence interval. So in the Excel template, all those calculations are laid out for us. Um, they plug in their half length, the um, common standard deviation and they get, um, they need to uh, just have a sample size of 49. And those calculations are um, involved here. So it's uh, the similar to the uh, comparing um, for one mean, where did it go? But instead um, is multiplied by And then finally, if we wanted to determine the sample size for um, proportions for out of spec products. So each plant um, 
how many products in each plant must be sampled to get a sufficiently narrow confidence interval for the difference between the proportions of out of spec products. So there's two plants and um, the supervisor of the, the company with the two plants suspects that the proportion of out of spec products in each plant is in the range of three to 5%. And he wants a 99% confidence interval um, with a half length of 0 0.005. So when he first runs this calculation and it's all laid out in um, Excel with the formulas, When, he first, when you first run this um, with the things he laid out, so the confidence interval is 99%, the half length of the interval, this is all information given to us. And then um, the sample size is calculated based off of that, that PowerPoint um, formula that we're not gonna get into. Um, he would have to take a 1,009 samples from each plant um, to be confident about the difference between their proportions and that's prohibitive. So if he lowers his confidence now um, to 95%, his sample size is reduced to 584, which may or may not be as prohibitive, but just something to keep in mind. Um, if you were to drop the confidence down to 90, um, the sample size is only reduced by um, less of a factor. So it goes down to 412, but you can see how um, the tighter or the more confidence you have or the tighter that you want that interval, the larger and larger and larger the N has to be. So let's say um, that the half length, he wants it to be even smaller. He wants a really, really tight interval. Look at how many samples. Um, that would be even more prohibitive. So. You can play around with these things if you'd like um, and see. So um, for example, in the sandwich one, um, we wanted to get that half length down to 0.3, but let's say um, they wanna be, they want like a really small interval. They want it to be like plus or minus 0.1. Now they've got to pull almost a thousand people. So. Okay, before we move on to um, discussion, I threw a lot at you guys um, trying to balance, and this is the first time I've done this, so I apologize if it seemed a little broken up, but trying to balance what you need to actually know in terms of math and formulas and um, what I want you to get away from this lecture, which is um, if you understand how to input the information into the template, can you interpret the results of the template? Can you tell me um, that the difference between the means of two populations is some number plus or minus some interval? Can you give me the lower bound and the upper bound? And can you assess whether or not um, that confidence interval is reasonable or is it really wide? Um, should the sh um, should the business, the whatever the problem happens to be, it's hard to speak in generic terms, but um, should the analyst propose maybe increasing the sample size or um, do they have enough information in that particular problem to move forward given what you've calculated out using the Excel spreadsheet. So okay, that said, um, why don't we move into our discussion? Um, we'll talk about the data science life cycle, get away from all this math for a minute. And then um, we can talk about homework and stuff at the end. And those of you who feel good can drop. Um, and those of you who want to stay behind can, can stay. Um, the homework for this week is not 
anything crazy. It, it may not take you very long really to do it all. Um, you'll use the templates that are provided and just plug in some information and then interpret the information. And that's really all I want to make sure that you guys get out of this. So if you're struggling with that, reach out to me. I wanna make sure that, the, that you understand the core concepts that we've covered. Okay, so one of the articles that I shared with you and one of the videos was on the data science life cycle. And um, this life cycle is pretty standard across really any company, um, anywhere that you work that does analytics, you're gonna identify a problem. You, there's a lot of work that goes into the business understanding stage that's uh, not always um, thought about until you're in real life working these problems. Um, before you even touch or collect data, there's a whole bunch of work that just goes into understanding the problem and whether or not it's amenable to an analytics solution at all. Then um, we got to get some data. We have to look at our data, make sure we understand it. Does it make sense? Um, that that would involve some visualizing of it and some some cleaning. We might need to do some transformations on our data to make it usable. And then, then after all that, we can build a model, um, train it, validate it, deploy it, and then monitor it. So a lot of people just wanna jump right into building a model, but there's a lot of stuff that goes into a data analytics problem before then. So for problem identification, we're framing the business problem. We have a whole class on this in, um, in, at the graduate level. We're figuring out um, whether or not this problem even can be solved with analytics and what that would look like. We're narrowing down the scope. Um, so we're identifying the problem and then we're coming to an understanding, we're framing it. We need a business objective. Um, we're defining our criteria for whether or not a analytic solution would be successful. So we don't just blindly apply models. Uh, we have to know, we have to have some way of measuring whether or not our solution is gonna be uh, successful. We're going to identify variables that the model is going to predict. Uh, and also, how are we gonna integrate this model with our current business processes? So if we come up with a solution, how are we gonna deploy it? How will it look in the grand scheme of all our other analytics processes, the models, the data that's currently out there? Then we go out and gather our data. This might involve uh, ETL processes, extract, transform, and load. Uh, that's sometimes referred to as data wrangling. So that's pulling the data from different sources, merging it. We might need to transform some of it, some of the variables so that we can use them. And we got to load them into one place for us to pull that data and do our analysis. Some people's jobs are just that. They don't, they're just data engineers and they just do ETL. We applied some data quality and cleansing rules. So we would search for negative values when there shouldn't be any outliers, things like that. And just kind of general data cleaning. Then we'll look at our data. We might do some initial visualiza visualization, some histograms, look at how our, our, if there's any correlations between variables, a lot of descriptive data, uh, statistics at this point, just to understand what we're looking at. We look at means, uh, quartiles, things like that. And this will give us the information we need to determine whether or not we need to do any transformations, like transforming any variables into log space or scaling them, encoding them as binary, things like that. Um, do we have skewed data? Do we have biased data? too many outliers, how are we gonna find outliers, how are we gonna detect them? Then we can create a model. <laughs> so all that work, now we build the model. That's the fun part that everybody sees and that gives you the cool responses at the end um, and ideally gives you your solution. So we create the model, we have to select an algorithm and do a lot of cross-validation, a lot of training to make sure that our model is valid. Um, and then we would deploy it 
integrate it into the business operations. And then we have to watch our model and keep continuously check it to make sure that it's still valid um, and still giving us the results that we want. So for you guys, um, your discussion this week was about all the stages of the life cycle, kind of summing them up and what do they mean? Um, and then I am curious to hear your guys' thoughts. So this is where you guys take over. What do you think is the most time consuming phase and which phase do you think you would most enjoy? <laughs> 